Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Ferox and today I'd like to talk to you about Cushing syndrome. That's Cushing's with an ING, not cushion like the thing that you sit on. This is a very common endocrinopathy of dogs, which means it's a hormonal disorder. Specifically, there's too many glucocorticoids running around the dog. Most of the time we talk about corticosteroids or cortisone in this context. Now, one way you can get Cushing syndrome is by physically giving the dog too much cortisone tablets or injections either way, but it has to happen across a long period of time. Most of these cases are either caused by a tumor on the adrenal glands, which produce cortisone, or a tumor in the pituitary gland of the brain, which tells the adrenal glands to produce cortisone. The way this system works is that the pituitary gland produces, among many other things, a hormone called adrenocorticotropic hormone, which basically means the hormone that tells you to make corticosteroids. So our pituitary gland tells our adrenals to make cortisone, and the cortisone from our adrenals tells our pituitary gland to make less ACTH. My handwriting is terrible, I apologize. And most of the time this will work in balance. However, if you get a tumor on an adrenal gland, it does not care at all about ACTH. And so it will just keep out pumping more and more and more cortisone. Conversely, if you get a tumor on your pituitary gland that produces more and more ACTH, you will get adrenals that respond dutifully, become super big, and pump out more and more and more cortisone. And then you get Cushing syndrome. Cushing syndrome in dogs can present with a number of different symptoms. First is a very obvious one and often one that's noticed early on, but it's also accompanied by hunger, which is directly thanks to the corticosteroids running around. Animals on prednisolone will have similar effects. You also tend to get hair loss on the body, although often the head and feet are okay, and you often get a pot belly. This is due to both muscle loss, thanks to the corticosteroids, but also the liver typically gets very large. There are other symptoms associated with Cushing syndrome, like a high resting blood glucose and changes to your biochemistry. Um, now it is worth mentioning that these tumors that occur on the pituitary gland of the brain and the adrenal glands are often very small. So most of the time, they're not gonna spread around the body and do nasty, nasty cancer things. Very occasionally, you'll get a pituitary tumor that does grow and it can cause things like seizures and blindness. And occasionally you'll get some random tumor elsewhere in the body that purely by accident happens to produce ACTH-like chemicals. But they're pretty rare and obscure. Now, diagnosing Cushing syndrome can be a little bit tricky because we're measuring cortisone in most cases. And cortisone can go up quite naturally when you have a dog that is sick or stressed. That sort of stress could include chronic illness, injury, or sometimes even going to the vet clinic. Dogs that get stressed at the vet clinic are particularly difficult to get a solid diagnosis for Cushing syndrome because it's difficult to separate how much is actual illness and how much is just very scary vet clinic. Now, one way we can try and diagnose it is with a urine test in which we measure the cortisone to creatinine ratio. Creatinine is a, a pretty harmless little protein that gets excreted in urine, just normally. And cortisone will also be excreted in urine. If you compare the ratio of a normal dog to an abnormal dog, Anything that's made the cortisone go higher in the dog's blood will be reflected in the urine. Cushing syndrome will often produce a positive result, which is a great start. However, stressed or sick dogs will also 
probably have a positive result, which limits the value of this test. It's still a good first test, but it's often not enough on its own to make a solid diagnosis. Now, another common test we do for Cushing syndrome is called the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test, or LDDST for short. In this test, we're also measuring the cortisone levels in the dog. In a normal dog and a Cushing syndrome dog, there is going to be some overlap. But at the start, once we've taken our sample, we give them a low dose of dexamethasone. Now, in a normal dog, the negative feedback loops will then tell the dog to produce less cortisone of its own. And so over a couple of hours, their cortisone levels drop. However, in a dog with Cushing syndrome, those tumours either in the brain or on the adrenal glands just don't care. And so their cortisone levels stay round about the same. Often they'll go up a little bit because they're in a scary vet clinic. This test is very, very sensitive, which means that if your dog has Cushing syndrome, it will probably show up positive. But it is not all that specific, because if you have a dog with any other illnesses at all, or if they're just a bit of a stress head, you might still get results that are too high. The third test that we commonly do for Cushing syndrome is the ACTH stimulation test. You'll recall ACTH being the hormone that tells the adrenals to produce more cortisone. So when we measure our cortisone levels at the start, when we give ACTH at the beginning, we expect a normal dog to produce more cortisone in the hour or so after they've been given the stimulation. A dog with Cushing syndrome is already producing just about as much cortisone as it possibly can, and so it doesn't change very much. So while the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test was measuring your adrenal's ability to switch off, the ACTH stimulation test is measuring their ability to switch on. And it's for this reason that we often use this particular test to monitor the dog's response to therapy. Because if we treat Cushing syndrome, but we treat it too aggressively, we often accidentally make them Addisonian instead, which is probably more life-threatening than Cushing syndrome is. There are, broadly speaking, a few different ways to treat Cushing syndrome from a medical standpoint. Neither of these ways actually remove the tumours, but they do keep the dog's symptoms under control and give them a good quality of life. Some ways basically obliterate parts of the adrenal gland making your adrenals smaller and weaker so that they produce less cortisone. My preferred treatment method is to competitively inhibit cortisone production, which means the drugs come in somewhere along this pathway and reduce the amount of cortisone that gets produced. You still need some to be produced, just nowhere near as much as the Cushing syndrome was allowing. I think that this is safer and you're less likely to induce an Addisonian crisis. Cushing syndrome is a bit of a complicated mess, especially when you're learning about it for the first time. And there are actually other tests that we can also do, including ultrasounds and CT scans and high-dose dexamethasone suppression tests. But most of the time, if the dog looks Cushingoid and it's got a positive on at least two tests, we call it a Cushing dog and we treat accordingly. So thanks for listening. I hope you learned something. My name is Dr. Ferox, and I will see you next time.